What I'm going to tell you right now is the story of how Calvin and Benson and their colleague Bassam figured out the pathway now known as the Calvin cycle, which is how all photosynthetic organisms and even uh, chemos, some chemosynthetic organisms use to fix inorganic carbon and convert it to organic carbon. So this photo here at the right is, illustrates uh, their apparatus to investigate carbon fixation. Inside this lollipop, they grew uh, cultures of unicellular algae, and they shone light. So you can think of this glass lollipop culture as kind of like a leaf, because it's kind of flat like a leaf and has a lot of surface area for illumination. Now into this culture they can bubble in radioactive carbon dioxide for these algal cells to fix and turn into organic carbon. At various time points they can open the spigot and release some algal cells into this flask of hot ethanol which immediately stops the reaction and then they can separate the components or analyze the radioactive components by two-dimensional paper chromatography and autoradiography. What ha happens in that procedure is that the organic molecules are separated in two dimensions on a, a piece of a sheet of chromatography paper. You put a piece of x-ray film. The radioactive compounds in the sheet of chromatography paper expose the x-ray film and when you develop the x-ray film you see these black spots which correspond to the locations of the uh, radioactively labeled organic compounds. Then you can compare the locations of these spots to known spots, uh, to the spots of known compounds and thus identify them. So when they did this experiment after 30 seconds of labeling in the presence of radioactive CO2. What they found is that the carbon, all kinds of compounds, uh, became labeled. Uh, we see some amino acids like glycine and alanine, uh, aspartic acid, malic acid is a four carbon sugar, and here we see sucrose which is a, a disaccharide of two uh, six carbon sugars. So what we see is that in in as little as 30 seconds, carbon has, the radioactive carbon dioxide has been incorporated into all kinds of molecules. Well, if, he, if they uh, went to shorter and shorter times, fewer and fewer molecules became labeled. So here we still see, even at uh, 10 seconds, uh, glucose is uh, labeled. But what we see is that the most intensely labeled spot is phosphoglyceric acid, right? also known as 3-phosphoglycerate. That's 3-phosphoglycerate, which is the same thing as P-glyceric labeled here. And at even shorter times, 5 seconds, this is pretty much the predominant radioactively labeled spot. Here at 2 minutes, you can see uh, again, lots of other things being labeled. So based on these results, they deduced that this 3-carbon sugar, 3-phosphoglycerate, yeah, was essentially the first molecule, the first stable molecule that they could find that was uh, labeled and it was labeled at the carboxyl group, which makes sense if you're going to be adding a radioactive carbon dioxide to an organic molecule. They further deduced that it must be a cyclic process because if you want longer times, then the other carbons of 3-phosphoglycerate became labeled. But this was the big question. You figure that if you're going to get a three carbon compound as a result of adding a single molecule of carbon dioxide, 
then there should be a two carbon compound. So, you know, two plus one equals three. But there was no two carbon compound. They could not identify any two carbon compound that could act as an acceptor, that could combine with carbon dioxide to form 3-phosphoglycerate. Now, being some, being good biochemists, they hypothesized that this 3-carbon sugar, 3-phosphoglycerate, would be reduced by the products of light reactions, ATP and NADPH, to another 3-carbon sugar called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And they were, they hypothesized this because these are both intermediates of glycolysis. In glycolysis, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is gradually oxidized to 3-phosphoglycerate, and that energy is used to generate ATP by substrate level phosphorylation and NADH. Well, since the light reactions produce ATP and NADPH, and it's consumed by the carbon fixation reaction, it made sense then that we could at least partially reverse glycolysis and use the reducing power and ATP to take 3-phosphoglycerate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So this is a, a diagram that summarizes their hypothesis that first of all it's a cycle there's some compound X which is still unidentified which combines with CO2 to form 3-phosphoglycerate and where do does and then ATP and NADPH are produced by the light reactions to convert 3-phosphoglycerate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate And what they saw is that 3-phosphoglycerate becomes labeled with carbon, radioactive carbon dioxide in both light and the dark. Okay, so this reaction, this reaction here, X plus CO2 forms 3-phosphoglycerate, doesn't actually require light. However, to go from 3-phosphoglycerate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate requires light because they require the products of the light reactions. So based on this hypothesis, they asked, what would happen if there was no CO2? I mean, there was no CO2 at all. Okay. So if they, could, if they could simply eliminate CO2, they figured that what would happen is that the cycle, this step would be blocked, and what would then happen is that since this is a cycle, all of these compounds would cycle around until they became compound X, at which point compound X would accumulate because there was no CO2 available to combine with compound X and turn into 3-phosphoglycerate. So basically, everyone, all of these molecules are running around in this cycle, and suddenly you put up a roadblock, and all of these molecules pile up behind the roadblock. And, and we ask, well, what happens? What compound accumulates when we interrupt the cycle in this way? By doing this experiment, they discovered, surprise, surprise, it was not a two-carbon car compound that accumulated. It was a five-carbon di uh, a five-carbon sugar with two phosphates. And this 5-carbon sugar is called ribulose. And since the phosphates are in the 1 and 5 carbons, it's called ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. Since that's a real mouthful, we will just call it RUBP. Okay. So this 5-carbon compound combines with a carbon dioxide, and it forms a very transient, highly unstable 6-carbon intermediate which immediately breaks down to form two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. And the enzyme that does this is called Rubisco, which is the short version of RUBP carboxylase oxygenase. We will just affectionately 
call this Rubisco. And if you think about it, this is probably the most abundant enzyme on Earth. Every single atom, essentially, of organic carbon on Earth got here by the action of Rubisco. So if you think about the petagrams of carbon that are fixed uh, worldwide on a global scale every year, that is all due to, or virtually all, due to this one enzyme, Rubisco. So, as I said, all photosynthetic organisms have Rubisco, and many chemosynthetic organisms also use Rubisco for carbon fixation.